Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Now that spring is here, it's about time to get organized for those summer crops. And for those of you thinking about sorghum, we have some advice today. Here's SUNUP's Dave Deacon and our soil nutrient specialist, Brian Arnell. Signs point to the fact that this may be a good year for sorghum. And Brian, what are some of the things producers need to be thinking about if they're thinking of sorghum? You know, working with Rick Kokenauer for the last several years, our uh, former sorghum extension specialist who's uh, now left OSU, we put together a couple key items to be thinking about when we're planting sorghum. We came up with four really big keys that you got to keep in mind. The first is planting date. Uh, with a lot of the work that Rick had done in the past, uh, planting date was exceptionally important. Uh, if you're south of that I-40 region, it's that April 1, you start planting. So planting time is now April 1 through about April 30th, April 15th in that window. Ideal window for north of I-40 I is that April 15th to April 30th window. We want to be getting in there. The idea is to get the, wheat, uh, the, the sorghum in the ground, get it up, and really start beating the heat. We want it done before it gets too hot and too dry. And so, you know, sorghum has a temperature. You want to look at your, your soil temps to be in about an average, daily average soil temp of 60 degrees, which right now we're all, we're, we're there. We could be planting sorghum about anywhere in the state. The next key is looking at the hybrid selection. And a lot of that comes more to a maturity group, getting, getting good genetics for your region. So I always recommend uh, talking with your local seedsman and seeing, you know, what genetics are working best. But pay attention to the maturity group. Earlier in that planting window, you go with a little bit longer maturity, but as you get closer to that May 1st date, you start shortening up your maturity group. There's a, a timeline Rick had sent me once that always put that between May 1 and June 1, when it comes to sorghum, you should go play golf or go to the lake. <laughs> Don't be planting during that time window. Right. So, so stick with that, you know, plant during that April. We've had great success with, with April planting dates uh, in a lot of our work. We're averaging to 120 to 170 bushel sorghum on a regular basis. The third key that we always have to talk about that I think has, has hurt sorghum in the past is soil fertility. Mm -hmm. Sorghum has always been that, that double crop or that, that secondary crop and not given a lot of attention to. It needs a significant amount of nitrogen to hit maximum yields. We have our standards in the soil fertility handbook and the peat sheets that I put out on your yield goal to final end rate. But a, a simple rule of thumb is thinking of a 1.2 pounds of end per bushel. And so if you think of it that way, you shoot for, if you want 100 bushel sorghum, you need uh, at least 120 pounds of end. And a lot of sorghum producers I've talked to in the past, they may not put in that much down. If you want to shoot for 120 or 150 bushel sorghum, you need to make sure that that nitrogen is adequate to get that crop to that point. Otherwise, you'll never make it there. Phosphorus and potassium and soil pH are also exceptionally important. And I like putting a little uh, starter down with sorghum. Uh, it seems to give a good start up if the soils aren't quite warm enough yet and gets that crop off and, uh, earlier, helps maturing it up later. The final point is weed control. Weeds are a problem in sorghum because we have a lack of over-the-top options. So pre-plant uh, weed control is exceptionally important. And atrazine dual mix, getting something down to suppress weeds. We do have one or two over-the-top options now, but weed control, so we aren't fighting that. And that crop has much availability to the water <clears throat> and the nutrients in the soil that it possibly can. Those are the four primary keys. There's a couple other things I like to tell people to keep an eye on. Um, we have a sugarcane aphid that came through last year. Scouting for insects and in sorghum is exceptionally important. We can, um, we need to keep an eye on aphids and other things to make sure that we keep our insect populations down. And if you break those critical thresholds, go and apply. I also li really like to terminate my crop at maturity mm -hmm. with glyphosate. It helps with harvest, it keeps dry down. So we have a more uniform harvest. It goes through the combines easier, a little bit easier to thresh, everything's dried down. But as much as anything else, maturing that crop with glyphosate or terminating it before harvest kills a plant. If you harvest sorghum without, without treating it, without maturing it or, or terminating it, it's going to be green after you cut it with a combine. Mm, okay. That green is going to suck up moisture. And so if we want to follow uh, sorghum with a wheat or a canola, we need to terminate it to make sure it's not sucking up any moisture that doesn't need to be pulled. And we need to prep for that falling crop as best as possible. Now let's talk about some of the, the, the possible following crops after sorghum. You know, so if, if we're following sorghum, we're looking at more likely coming in with winter wheat crop, mm -hmm. uh, winter canola crop, 
and uh, you watch residuals. Uh, you got to make sure with crop rotation that you haven't applied anything either going into sorghum or coming out of sorghum that can impact that. But typically, if you terminate your sorghum, you've got plenty of time to come in, uh, terminate an early plant of sorghum. Right. You have plenty of time to come in with a wheat or a canola crop soon thereafter. Why, why is the month of May so bad for planting of sorghum? <laughs> It typically puts, if, if you're planting in May, and it's not an always because right. you know the way the Oklahoma weather is. Oh, yeah. so every now and then you, you, you get it wrong. But in the month of May, with the maturity groups that are typically planted in the state, it puts that flowering in August. Mm. Okay. You know, we want to avoid anything in August. <laughs> right. The plants don't like it and we don't like right. it. So if we can avoid outside, so we want to get those plants flowering prior to August uh, and avoid that heat so that they have good pollen, good, good pollination and everything goes there. Now, you actually have a blog that covers a lot of this. Let's talk about that. Okay, so on that blog, we go through the four keys, um, the, the planting date, the hybrid selection, the fertility and weed control. Thank you, Brian. And for a link to his blog, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Fall calving cows are routinely weaned when the calves are nine to 10 months of age, which means that uh, usually we'll wean them in late June or July. If you have some young fall calving cows that you're a little concerned about the body condition as we come out of the winter, you might want to rethink that weaning date. Here at Oklahoma State University, uh, researchers looked at two different weaning dates for fall calving cows. They weaned half of the cows in April and the other half at a more typical time in early July. They looked at the weights of the calves and the reproduction capability of those cows the following year. And they found some pretty substantial differences. With young cows, those that are two or three years of age, they found that they could really impact the reproductive capability of those cows the following year by early weaning, by weaning in April. And the difference there was statistically significant, about 10% difference in rebreeding percentages. Mature cows, however, those that were four years of age or, or older, they really didn't see that kind of difference in rebreeding performance by early weaning. And so uh, with those mature cows, especially if they're in decent body condition, I'd suggest that we leave the calves on the cow until the typical time there in late June or early July. Now, if we wean in April, I realize these calves are going to be a lot lighter than they would be if we waited until a couple of months later. Uh, the research here said as much as 200 pounds difference. If the calves are kept and put out on native pasture, then the difference was only about 160 pounds. Those calves that were early weaned were still a little bit lighter. And so we have to take that into uh, uh, consideration as we're making this decision. But I really think that if you've got some young, two-year-old, three-year-old cows, that you're concerned about the body condition on them going into the summer period, Early weaning is probably a pretty good option. It allows those cows to have all summer to bounce back, regain body condition before they calve again next fall, and therefore expect a really, really good rebreeding performance out of those cows the following year. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow-Calf Corner. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, joins us now. And Kim, we saw a 31 cent price jump with wheat. Talk about that. Well, we had two uh, USDA reports come out this week. Uh, they came out with the planting or the seeded acres, and they came out with the crop conditions reports. Why don't we have an overview of those starting with the planted acres? You look, I think that was good news for the, uh, the wheat industry. You look at all planted acres. They were down about uh, 3% at 54.4 million acres compared to 57.1 last year 
last year. Winter wheat acres were down uh, 4% at uh, 40.8 point, point uh, million acres, 42.4 last year. And hard red winter wheat acres were down 3%, 29.6 million acres compared to 30.4 last year. I think that's good news price-wise, and we saw a little bump from that. And then in terms of crop conditions, how did that play in? Well, there's been a lot of, of talk out in the, in the industry and, and from producers about how bad the crop is. But you, you look at the crop conditions reports. Now, they're by state. Uh, we'll get an all-state report uh, coming out this next week. But Colorado, uh, good to excellent ratings, 58% uh, this year compared to 12% last year. You've got Kansas, 39% good to excellent compared to 32 last year. you got Oklahoma, 44% percent good to ex excellent 17 percent last year in texas 55 percent good to ex excellent versus 11 percent last year so you, you look at those numbers uh, you've got uh, significantly better crop conditions this year than last year you remember last year the production was uh, 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 738 million uh, bushels for hard red winter wheat. Our average is 893. That price jump you mentioned, what do you think prices will do now? Well, if you're looking at what's going on, I think another thing that I didn't mention was that dollar index, the value of the dollar relative to other currencies. That's been coming down just ever so slightly, and that's positive. Uh, that Kansas City uh, July uh, contract up 23 cents. Uh, it's got resistance at 580. Uh, support at 540. It's pounding against that uh, $5.80. If it can break through that, we got another 40 cent up move. And what do you think will be the major determiner of that? What it's going to take is some weather and, and lower production, either in the United States or in some foreign country. And we've been hearing about some problems in Russia, Ukraine, but those reports are mixed. Okay, Kim Anderson, thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. And now we want to take a look at the Farm Bill with our Ag Policy Specialist, Eric DeVeast. Late last week, uh, USDA announced uh, a one-week extension on the Farm Bill election, that's the ARC County, ARC individual PLC decision, and on the yield update and the base acre reallocation decision. At this point, USDA said 98% of landowners have gone ahead and, and completed their part of the decision, and that is the yield update and the base acre reallocation. 90% of producers have signed up as of late last week. So they went ahead, extended for one more week, um, came as a surprise. There were county offices in, in the state of Oklahoma, FSA offices, that had announced they were gonna be open on Saturday to try to get everybody signed up before the March 31 deadline. And then uh, Washington came out and said they were gonna extend for one week. So what that means is, if you're not on a list to get in sometime, there are offices that are signing up well into April, you need to call, you need to run into the office before Tuesday and sign up or make an appointment to get signed up. They're not going to extend beyond this. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. Spring has arrived in Oklahoma this first week in April. This week we were treated to warm days and more spring storms. Our three-day average of four-inch bare soil temperature as of April 1st ranged from 55 degrees in the northeast to 68 degrees in south-central Oklahoma. The mid-60s are ideal for many garden and crop plants. Oh, and all those weeds, too. Storms develop rapidly Tuesday night. Those storms left scattered areas with an inch or more of rain, the green colored areas, and one very intense storm near the Bow Legs Mesonet site, the red dot, received more than eight inches of rain. Bow Legs recorded five and eighty-five hundredths inches, just east of there in Holdenville only seventy-two hundredths of an inch of rain. The majority of that rain at the Mesonet Bowleg site came in two deluges. An inch and 62 hundredths fell in 35 minutes between 8.55 and 9.30 Tuesday night. The second deluge of three and 54 hundredths inches lasted an hour and 15 minutes from 10 p.m. to 11.15. What a wet night for folks in central Seminole County. Here's Gary with a longer look at Oklahoma's rainfall and what's ahead. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everybody. 
Well, we've had our first big severe weather outbreak, our first tornadoes, but the best news of all, I think, is that we've gotten a lot of good rainfall recently. Uh, now, that does have its impact on the drought. It, unfortunately, it comes with those bad things like tornadoes. Let's take a look at the latest drought monitor map and see where we've been helped and also where we've been hurt. The new drought monitor map shows exactly what you would expect from the recent rainfall patterns. More improvement in the southeast and intensification in the north and west. Most of western and far northern Oklahoma remain in severe to exceptional drought, unfortunately. What's in store for us for April? It is a spring month. It's supposed to be a rainy month. Well, the Climate Prediction Center sees increased odds for above normal temperatures, which we don't want to see because that would impact drought, and also increased odds for above normal precipitation in the far southeastern corner of the state, the part of the state that needs it the least, unfortunately. But good for those folks. Now, when you put all that together, where's drought at now? Uh, what are the outlooks for April? The U.S. monthly drought outlook for that month shows that drought is expected to either persist or intensify throughout the month of April, so not good news on that front. Now these are just outlooks, they're not always correct, so we still have hope for spring and we can maybe start to end some of this drought across the state. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Joining us now is Daryl Peel, our Livestock Marketing Specialist. And Daryl, spring is finally here, the weather feels great. Let's talk about prices, seasonal prices, how do things look? Well, you know, we've, we've seen, uh, you know, feeder and fed cattle prices strengthen a little bit after the lows we experienced in February. Um, you know, we're probably approaching that spring peak in many cases, so I don't know that we'll see a lot more. Having said that, at this point in time, cattle slaughter is still down over 7% this year. Beef production is down about 5%, so we're keeping total beef supplies in the system pretty tight. That's providing support, and as long as the box beef prices can stay high, then that's gonna keep these fed cattle prices high as well. And then are we seeing kind of a similar momentum in terms of demand? Well, we've had a lot of concerns about beef demand for a long time, and especially going into this year, one of our biggest concerns was the fact that we were gonna see increased supplies of competing meat in terms of pork and poultry. We got a hog and pigs report about a week ago which confirmed that in fact we do have a fairly large increase in, in hog numbers right now. We're gonna see a lot of market hogs come into town over the next few months. There are some indications in that report that uh, the hog industry recognizes they've probably overshot the market a little bit, so we may see it taper off by the end of the year. But for a few months here, we're gonna have an awful lot of pork in the market to deal with, and that is a continuing concern on the beef demand side. Another big report out this week on prospective plantings. Talk about that in terms of the cattle industry. Well, in a general sense, uh, you know, I think uh, the cattle industry is, is probably uh, happy with the fact that the corn planting's acreage is not down as much as we expected, a little bit bigger than expected, even though it will be down compared to a year ago. In Oklahoma, probably the more significant number is the fact that uh, all hay harvested acres is down significantly from a year ago, but that's because last year was a really big number. Uh, with some improvement in forage conditions last year and with animal numbers, cow, cattle numbers being down last year, we harvested a lot of hay and we rebuilt stocks. And we're gonna see those hay harvestings pull back this year, but that's probably a reflection that we're using more of those acres to pasture the growing numbers of animals we've had. We've had significant expansion in the last two years in Oklahoma's cattle numbers. Okay, and let's hope the momentum continues. Exactly. Okay, Daryl Peel, our Livestock Marketing Specialist. Thanks a lot. Hi, welcome to Shop Stop. We want to spend a little bit of time talking about AC tools and uh, polarity. Okay, what is polarity? You've got a plug and it's got two prongs, for example, and you've got a plug that's got three prongs, for example, and their derm the polarity is determined by which one is the neutral and which one is the hot. So you want to make sure that when you're plugging stuff in that with, with your plugs as they match like this, that it'll only go into the outlet in one way. Correct, because one of these spades is wider than the other one, and if, if you go to your recep, well, one of the slots is larger than the other slot, and that will only let it go in one way, and that this larger slot is your neutral. And so the important thing to remember is, is when you're working on stuff, that we're always going to switch the, the, the hot line off, not the neutral. Right. So 
let's say that, that this cord got damaged and was cut right here and the, the plug was gone, how could we determine whether or not this was, which was neutral and which was hot on this? If you look at the cord, it has ribs on one side and smooth on the other. That would determine that the rib side is the neutral side and the non-rib side, the smooth side, is what we'd call the hot side. So then you could reattach a new plug to it. Yeah, and uh, so these are set like that. If you've got the plug with the ground on it, then it's only gonna go into the outlet one way and then the ground uh, plug is gonna dictate which one goes into the neutral slot. So you've got three prongs and two prongs and on, you'll notice on some of your power tools they'll have a three prong or two prong and the two prongs can only go on what we call a double insulated tool. And the double insulated tool is signified by that double square right there. If your tool has that, that means it's double insulated. So there's a few tips on polarity and how tools are wired. We'll see you next week on Chop Stop. A reminder for producers about upcoming canola field tours beginning April 14th at stops across Oklahoma. For more information, you can visit our website or you can always contact your local county extension office. Uh, a lot of times after many of our land management practices that we do, a lot of clearings, either cutting cedar trees mechanically, clearing areas and doing that, we end up with brush piles. And brush piles are always problematic. Uh, if we look at the statistics for the southeastern U.S. at the cause of wildfires, typically 60, over 60% 60 of all the wildfires that are caused in the southeastern U.S. are caused by brush pile burning. And so they're a big problem. And so kind of what I want to talk to you about was when is the best time of the year to burn brush piles and how can we do it safely and not cause such a problem? Uh, you know, a lot of times people think that the best time to burn a brush pile is when it snows and we have snow on the ground. But as we know here in Oklahoma, most of the time our snow just doesn't last very long and typically it's gone in a day or two. You know, we may go out and light the brush pile when it's snowing or right after it's snowed. And that brush pile continues to burn for several days, even weeks after you've lit it off and that snow's gone. And once that snow goes, leaves, the, the dry vegetation around it dries out pretty quickly and is flammable. And a lot of times once you get a big strong front coming through with high winds, blows those embers from that pile around and next thing you know, you've got an escape fire from that brush pile. The best time of year that we have found to burn brush piles is typically late April, May, and June, whenever stuff starts to really green up. Because when stuff starts to green up in that time of year, we typically have lower incidence of wildfire, less chances of spot fires and escapes because of the green vegetation. Not saying that things will not burn, but they typically burn a lot slower and it takes more heat to get something to, to, to burn. So things to think about when you burn brush piles are what is the weather gonna be like today that you're gonna burn them? Is, are the winds strong or is there any chance of a front coming through? Then you also need to check the weather for the next day or the following couple of days to see what's coming because if there's gonna be a big change in the weather with strong winds coming and predicted, I wouldn't burn those brush piles. It's good to have some type of fire suppression equipment available. So if you do have a problem, you can readily attack it, put it out. So with any type of fire that you do, call the local fire department just to let them know. That's just a good common courtesy and a common practice. Call your neighbors, let them know what you're doing. Also, a couple of things that you might want to think about to control the intensity of your fire that you're gonna have a brush pile. You may have a large brush pile with a lot of dried cedars that are gonna be really flammable. You wanna to go to the downwind side of that brush pile 
and start your fire there. That way you're creating kind of a backfire through that brush pile where the fire is going to back slowly through that brush fire, reduce the intensity, the flame lengths, and probably the, chance, the probability of escapes happening. Whereas if you would go to the upwind side of it and light it, it's going to create a big head fire and engulf that brush pile a lot quicker and burn it up. And those are just some of the guidelines to help you have a safe brush pile burn.